So we've been looking at Richard Borkin's book and the last two videos have been basically playing devil's advocate, coming across and uh, critiquing his book, a book that generally speaking most of it, not all of it, I agree with. Um, so we play devil's advocate, specifically on the Papias um, scholarship. Um, so that's where we're at. Basically, the last two videos could be summed up when uh, Gary Habermas was debating Anthony Flew on the resurrection of Christ. Anthony Flew stated that he was an atheist at the time, became a deist later, but he stated that the resurrection is believable if it's in the context of the God of the, the Old Testament. And that's the point. I think that facts, without a without a context, don't get you completely to believe in Christ. In the sense that I can lay all the historical facts about Jesus in dying and rising again, but if someone doesn't believe there's a God, they're not going to end up believing Jesus as the Son of God and rising from the dead. So you have to give evidence and facts about Jesus and his life and this stuff about by Borkham is really helpful for that but at the same time you need to prevent present evidence <coughs> or some thoughts or some ideas about who God is and that why the resurrection would have taken place in the context of of the God of the Bible I think that can't be left out I, I, I think that's important so I think presuppositional apologetics would be helpful at this point to bring in if you were debating or discussing. Okay, let's carry on with the book. We've got a few more videos to make. <coughs> I hope this, this study anyway introduces you to Balcom and introduces you and encourages you in your faith and challenges you as a skeptic. Some of it might be a bit too heavy for you. Uh, it's this is advanced studies on the topic so um, you'll have to read the book or go over the videos again uh, Balkan writes the four critics did not think much of the information which the ancient church provides concerning the concrete persons behind the gospels not even of the personal references in the New Testament the notion of a creative community makes questions of concrete traditions uninteresting. This depersonalization this this depersonalization has had a contagious effect right into the present. It still regularly happens that people literally speak of products of the church. That's Jimmy Dilly Dungan and of traditions which circulated in the communities instead of asking who has formulated or transmitted a certain text. Page 93. So this is really, really important because a lot of scholars, modern scholars, and this has been going on for over 150 years have actually been telling the public that they are historians looking at the ancient texts and looking at what the ancient writers are saying but actually what happens is they come with a theory and the theory has gone something like this it's come in different forms it might be Rainan, it might be Strauss it, it might be a Boltman it, it might be any number of these uh, critical scholars over a hundred and last fifty years and it, it comes down to this basically the church and what the church said is irrelevant we're going to find the original Jesus therefore we will look at the original Jesus and one of our theories is XYZ so in this particular case our theory is that there were communities who developed the oral tradition now the problem with that kind of thinking and led to great problems is 
number one it disparaged the church's evidence i.e. the early church fathers and secondly it was not it was not historically hermeneutical it was not rooted in the studies of the way things were actually were in the first century and what Balcom has shown is that it was not just these uh, anonymous communities that did oral tradition but that there were actually individuals who were authoritative who supervised the passing on of the information about Jesus and that those who collected that information were acting as not in oral tradition but oral historians which is a different way of writing a, day, a way of thinking that's where we're at and it had a disastrous effect Rudolf Bultmann the form critic ruled the roost in the 1960s virtually unchallenged but yet his basic principles one of them this idea of anonymous communities lacked no historical verification for such a methodology so what you've got to be careful of is when you have these academics who attack the Christian faith such as Richard Carey or Dr. Price or Bart Ehrman and they say that they're using objective criteria they say that they're coming at it from a historian's point of view you better double check whether that's the case you better double check whether they're actually looking in the historical context of the time in a fair honest way for example I have checked the quotes by Richard Carey of ancient text and he's always misquoting them I have checked the scholarship of a Dr. Price concerning Mithraism and how that has affected Christianity and it has no uh, evidence whatsoever I have checked various scholars about Ehrman's comments about the way um, liter uh, the, the lack of literacy and the problems that had on the uh, spread of the inter uh, the copying text of the Gospels I've checked these things and found that they do not actually correspond to the reality of the historical times that they're talking about it's incumbent upon you as a skeptic and as a Christian not just to listen to the scholars but to do your own research and to find out for yourself how many times have I heard atheists tell me that Jesus was a myth and yet when I call them out on it and ask them well where is your evidence they don't have any evidence and those atheists or those skeptics who said that Jesus exists will hint that Jesus was perhaps influenced uh, came out of the idea of Jesus came out of Mithraism and I have checked all this all the scholarship on this over a thousand years of history on Mithraism uh, from 500 a, uh, BC to 600 AD checked all the scholarly information that I could find on primary source historical material and found that the skeptics found that the atheists who insinuate this have not got any evidence to substantiate what they're saying page 95 that Jesus himself appointed 12 of his disciples for a special place in his mission of renewing and restoring God's people Israel has been doubted by some scholars following the lead of Rudolf Bultmann who have supposed that the notion of the 12 originated only later however a large majority of recent scholars has accepted it especially since it coheres so well with the trend to understand Jesus as thoroughly in thoroughly Jewish terms page 95 so you can see a massive seesaw going on in the history of historical scholarship concerning Jesus studies at the time of Boltman it was stated that this idea that Jesus had 12 main disciples is just pure myth but then when 
it, the scholars began to ditch the Boltman ideas and the form criticism and began to look at first century Judaism in the context of I kid you not first century Judaism in other words scholars realized that the Boltman project of the 1960s and the form criticism that went on and on and on about don't look at anything from a Jewish context because that's not true true to the context let's see what the Greek is the Greek context is of the gospel literature and that's the real authentic gospel literature but scholars realized that this was just not true that if we actually look at first century Judaism surely we need to consider that it was Jewish that there was a Jewishness about this literature that there were Jewish aspects to this literature that there was reflections of the Gospels of Jewish culture it, that it weren't just all Greek influenced and that made them realize that actually there were 12 disciples it was not just was not Greek it was something to do with the fact that the early disciples early first century Judaism had these kinds of rabbis and teachers that would do this and so therefore it became historically viable to say that Jesus had 12 disciples a complete seesaw in the scholarship what that tells you as a Christian is beware of any scholar that comes to you or when you go to university and the scholar is accepted by ultimately by the academic world in historical Jesus studies it doesn't mean diddly squat if you go to the evidence and the evidence completely disagrees with what the major scholars are saying do your own research and make sure that what you base your teaching on your ideas about Jesus is based on good fair honest open study of the evidence and if you did that as a skeptic you would become a Christian because you would see that your skepticism is not warranted if you were objective and fair in the studying of the evidence.